Hi, this is Mark Linson Meyer here talking with Fritjof Bergman about new work and the future for young people. Start us off. Well, the most common expression that is used by young people, but also by people of all ages, about our present condition is that we are in a bad economy. That's sort of how, in the simplest of language, people describe what is happening in Michigan, for example, where Michigan has a bad economy. And I want to go very far beyond that and see what we can say about what is actually happening, and not only in Michigan, and not only in the United States, but possibly really globally, and less that. Yeah, yes, a diagnosis is what's needed. But I especially want to concentrate on the question of what can be done about it. And of course, I, my starting point is that uh, most people have no idea of what can be done. It. And, and Obama is one of them, and it looks like it. And the main sort of point of origin is that people talk about inequality. That's become the governing phrase. And that the question is, okay, we have tremendous inequality. That is the measure of how bad the economy is. The size of unemployment, the size of people underemployed, the size of people who have not jobs that are at all stable and well paid. And the question is, okay, so what can we do to get out of this? And it's very obvious that so far we have not gotten out of it. And that's admitted by everybody. That's my picture. Now, uh, I want to sort of start this by saying, whatever we are in, and this is another phrase that is constantly used to describe our condition, we are not in a slow recovery where how this recovery happens to be so slow is a little bit puzzling for most people. And they say, well, well, we have done this and we have done that and we have tried everything at this point. All the things in the book about what can be done to stimulate an economy, to speed it up, to get people back to work. But when it comes, so to say, to the next paragraph, uh, the main point is that we haven't gotten anywhere and the situation has, if anything, gotten worse. And I emphasize, of course, and that's what is specific about me as opposed to other people, that I am not only talking about Michigan and I'm not only talking about the United States. I'm emphatically talking globally. And if you look globally, then the situation, let's say, in North Africa, or the situation in the Middle East, or the situation in Greece, or the situation in Spain, and on and on and on. In all of these countries or continents or territories, the situation has become worse. Now, why has it become worse? It's not a recession, and it's not a slow recession. It is not a recession where it's puzzling why it is so slow. It is something quite, quite different, namely, we have experienced three things. One of these is automation, the other of these is globalization, and the third of these is uh, the way in which farming has become a farming industry. And the industry of farming has separated enormous number of people from the work they used to do. I mean, that's one statistic that I like to use, that it used to be about 80% of the population that worked on farms. So that was four-fifths that worked on farms. And most of these no longer, it's now by some measures, 4% of people who work on farms. So the drop in farm jobs has been extraordinary, incredible. Come hardly to be believed. But that's what we have, and we have globalization, which really is different from what people think. Globalization does not just mean that uh, different kind of enterprises have moved uh, outside of our borders and are now in cheaper territory, in territories where the wages are lower. But no, globalization means that the whole planet has moved into a situation of uh, people 
being in the modern economy, which means that globalization really means that there is no place on this planet where people do not need jobs. That, that's the mode of work that has become absolutely prevalent for everybody. And so globalization means that we are all affected by this wholly and completely, and that automation very quickly, automation, and that is something that I think you, especially as young people, I think have some real relationship to, that automation is only at its beginning, and automation now involves the, the coming of all kinds of new gadgets, of which the iPhone is one, and, and the way in which globally, I mean, automation makes things ever smaller, microization, um, but also, of course, that this is true of computers, they have become smaller, but it's also true that we have these self-flying planes, and we also have from Google, we're close to self, self-driving self cars, and stop for that for a moment and think what that means. If we really have self-driving cars, how many people are still working at driving trucks or whatever, or pizza, uh, semi And the thing is that that all is in the process of being automated out from under people so that all of these jobs are in the process of being taken away from people. That is the meaning of why are we in a bad economy? We are in a bad economy for three reasons. Globalization, automation, and the migration away from farms. Those three things have the effect that the world over, very much also in the United States, very much also in uh, other countries, but the world over, we have lots and lots of people losing jobs, and that is the reason for unemployment, and it is not something that can be fixed with some little thing. That now is the main point, especially for young people. Now, Fritjof, Fritjof, since I know you've given these points before, can we break these down just a little bit to, to help people understand, you know, if, if you're talking to a young person in the U.S. who's facing a tough job market, saying that overseas the you know farms are going away is not going to be a particularly meaning, relevant, meaningful fact for them. Um, and it just, I, w- I want to see what your response to us, to a, a few of the, the responses that I get you know, when, when you put out this, this diagnosis of the problem. So first you said, well, we've tried everything to get the economy going. But that's not generally what I've heard, that uh, you know, political gridlock is such that liberals, for instance, will say, yes, we had a bailout and that was uh, uh, useful. Uh, it kept the recession from getting worse. But uh, because of the problems in Washington, the problems do, because basically the liberals don't have more power, um, we couldn't have as much of a bailout as we should have had. Um, and so really we haven't come anywhere close to trying everything in the toolbox uh, because we haven't been able to politically. Conservatives have a, a, a variation on that answer, which I'll go to in a minute. But let me, I want to hear what you say, first of all, to the, to the, to the liberal diagnosis that no, no, we, as far, you know, forget about the world economy. Maybe there are systemic problems with that. But in terms of just getting employment going here, getting industry going here again, that having, you know, more of a bailout or something would have would have done the job, would have injected money. If you get government spending more, then that puts more in people's pockets. The economy gets back going again. Uh, you know, the, the, the machine starts functioning as designed. <laughs> well, uh, it's all a matter of size of numbers. That is, uh, it is not true, and I will contest what you said, it is not true that all of these different things, including the bailout and so forth, if we only had had a little more money, maybe we would be where we need to be. Frankly, I think that's ludicrous. I mean, there are high numbers of unemployment, and not just abroad, and actually I think that's something that I want to resist. I don't just want to talk about the United States. The world is not homogenous. There are countries that are very different from the United States in which things function reasonably well, and that's Germany and Austria. Maybe those are the only two exceptions. But to me, that is a main fact, that 
there are only two or three small countries left in which things function more or less normally. And I will emphasize, even if you resist it to some extent, that, uh, and I think it is of great importance to young people to realize that, for example, Spain and Italy and Greece and on and on are in terrible shape and have up to 40% unemployment, up to 70% unemployment. And I think it is a fair estimate that these things that are now at high points in the countries I just mentioned will reach high points in many other countries. And that is relevant to the young people because I think one can read a trend, one can see which way this thing is going. And it is not going towards improvement, but it is going towards becoming worse. So I think it's a matter of size, it's a matter of statistics. If it were a small number, okay, okay, okay. But it's not a small number, it's a very large number. And then the uh, response we get from conservatives or more libertarian folks is, you know, first of all, we haven't tried their solution either, that uh, um, it's really, it's government that's holding things back. I, I find it hard to even uh, voice that argument coherently as, as concerns the United States. But just to look at a more common and maybe more plausible argument about the world, you know, yes, globalization uh, uh, has problems associated with it. But when you move an industry to a poor area, you're still introducing something to that area that gradually raises the, the standard of living of people. Uh, and so, yes, there's a lot of pain that comes with it, but it's been part of the overall, uh, you know, the fact that you hear statistics of you know, fewer people in whatever the definition of poverty is uh, worldwide in terms of, you know, having functioning plumbing and functioning, uh, uh, functioning, uh, you know, just basically having their food needs met, um, that I hear these statistics constantly for, for defenders of capitalism. So what, what, what do you say to all that? Ha! What I say to all that is that it is bullshit. Uh, I mean, of course, people uh, trot out the fact that some, uh, in some areas of China, for example, China is a notable example, yes, uh, prosperity has spread. But th that is actually one reason why we have this podcast right now. And that's why it is important and why it is tremendously important, especially for young people to listen to this. Because the fact, of course, isn't maybe the uh, uh, collapse of the factory in Bangladesh. Uh, many people call that a kind of wake-up call because the number of people who were killed in that collapse of uh, basically buildings that had to do with creating cloth, clothes uh, is, is absolutely huge. And so, uh, yes, here and there, some, uh, you know, some things have improved for some people, and that, and that I don't in any way want to deny. That is, it's important for the picture that we are moving towards a polarization, towards a transformation, a greater transformation than any transformation has been in a very long time. Not a recession, nothing like a recession. A recession is in some ways cyclical, but what we are going through are three tremendous trends that are all unidirectional, that all go in the direction of more globalization, more automation, more a movement away from farms into slums, into cities where people then collapse into uh, drugs and prostitution and poverty. The point is that in very large areas, that is the picture, but there is a polarization. And that actually is one of the dramatic, dreadful calamities that we are facing, that some people are enormously rich, more rich than anybody ever was before. But great numbers of people in India, and if I was in Russia, in Russia, very much in Russia, in any number of countries, of course, the countries of the Middle East of Africa, in those countries, there are islands of very great wealth. 
I in no way want to deny that. But the areas of outrageous, of damnable poverty are much greater than the areas of wealth. All right. So, so thanks for responding to those. Um, I know that's not going to be uh, too satisfying to, pe to people that are uh, you know, really committed to that viewpoint, but they probably wouldn't have gotten this far in our, uh, our YouTube channel here anyway. Go on with the story you were trying to tell before I interrupted you with these questions. That's fine. Thank you. I very much want that. I mean, uh, there are these three great trends, and they represent the early phases of an enormous transformation. And I mean transformation in the sense that there may not have been anything like this for, for eons or for, for very large spans of time. That is, the transformation that maybe comes closest to the kind of transformation we will now experience is the transition from, um, from hunting and gathering to agriculture, and maybe from agriculture to industrialization. But nothing other than that has the size, the moment, the power, the transformative quality that we are living now. And that, I think, is the main point for young people to understand that we are entering a phase of tremendous transformation where life in all of its dimensions will change from bottom to top, so to say. And what can be done about this is nothing like what conservatives talk about or what the other people you right now mentioned talk about. I will want to now outline what can be done about that. Because there are trends that make it possible to see a, a very optimistic, a very hopeful picture. And my basic stance is much more hopeful and optimistic than anything else. The key word for some of this is the word microization. That is that many things are becoming smaller. And a prime example in your own pocket of that is the iPhone. But of course, the computer is also something that has become much smaller from what it used to be. And on and on, uh, what became for new work very important is the idea of manufacturing in small rooms. That is, in, uh, in Austria, and we have some pictures of that, and maybe they can be shown in the connection right now. Um, we promoted and tested and advocated and showed the idea of manufacturing in small rooms. That is, we put that to, you know, we didn't just want to talk about it, we wanted to do it. So we demonstrated, we proved that it's possible to have very small units, that is to use machines that are microscopic, the, the machine that is best known for that is the fabricator. And uh, young people should definitely, absolutely acquaint themselves with what fabricators are. A fabricator is basically one machine that can do what a factory used to do, and it does it in the most astounding and miraculous way. A fabricator uses powders and puts layers of powders on top of each other somehow welds them to each other. But it is so that one machine in one room can create a great diversity and a great number of parts. And that's what we demonstrated in Austria, that we made many of the parts that you need for an electric motorcycle. We made an electric motorcycle that was even more than just electric, that is, it was an a motorcycle that people could put together themselves, and that was somehow theirs to make and enforced and reinforced their self-reliance and their autonomy and their ability to stand on their own feet. And we showed that in uh, the connection with an electric motorcycle, but the whole point was that if you can manufacture an electric motorcycle in three or four small rooms, not that's the big point, that's the big transformation, not in one huge factory, no, 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 no. What now has become possible, and it's a great advance. 
in very small rooms with very few machines to manufacture everything that you need in parts for an electric motorcycle. But the next step is, of course, right already there. Namely, if you can do that with a motorcycle, you can also do it with a washing machine. And if you can do it with a motorcycle and a washing machine, then you can also do it with a dryer. And you can do it with all the different kitchen utensils that are needed all over the place. So we now enter a phase, we enter an epoch, we enter a time span where we won't need big factories anymore, which of course is dramatic and which of course means still more unemployment and therefore all of these remedies against unemployment are silly. What now becomes possible is something quite, quite different from something that gets rid of unemployment in the old-fashioned sense. What now is possible is what we call, what new work calls, community production. Community production means that in small rooms with very small equipment that people use themselves, almost anything that they need can be created or can be manufactured. So that the landscape will become completely different from the landscape we have had in the past. And it's this, the landscape that young people should become accustomed to and that they should face up to and should realize that that is the landscape in which they will live and that is the landscape in which they have a chance to succeed and very importantly to lead a much better life than the past. That is crucial to my mind that we are in an ascent and new work demonstrates the possibility of a rising, of a staircase, of living a much better life in the past. And it is not a life where we struggle for the next 30 or 50 or 100 years against the next big depression and with hook and crook manage somehow to keep some people unemployed. That is not what we can do. We can do vastly better than that. We can move in the direction of community production, which means that in small rooms, in villages, on farms, in very small spaces, with very small and cheap equipment, because it has become cheap. Look at how cheap computers have become. Look at how cheap iPhones have become. They have be now become so cheap that with very cheap equipment, we can make all of these sophisticated things that represent a, a much more satisfying, a much more engaging, happy future than the future we had in the, in the past. Uh, now, I, I do want for people to look at the electric motorcycle, which we call the Steirer, after a city in Germany, to have a really good look at these pictures, but to go beyond these pictures and to see that it is a sample, it is a demonstration, it is a model. It shows what can be done. And this now is for young people. They should realize, okay, they made an electric motorcycle in three small shops, and that's literally true. Now, if that can be done in Austria, then it can also be done in Detroit. And if that's possible, we can manufacture washing machines and dryers and kitchen equipment and stoves and refrigerators and all of that in small spaces with relatively inexpensive machines. And I'm not talking about the future. I'm talking about what has now become possible. And this is the tasks in which young people should engage themselves. They should realize instead of the lies that other people tell them, that this is actually the future and this is what they must prepare. They must prepare themselves for community production. But community production is only one part. Okay, well, you say this is going on in the present, but we only hear this example of the motorcycle. Um, how, when do we get a proof of concept of this, this to show that this is uh, actually something that people could, could pursue as a way of life, that whole communities can do this? Well, um, that is very much the point that this is an aspect of new work that is spreading. I mean, I can mention any number of cities in Germany, for example, Stuttgart, Kiel, um, Munich. In all of these, uh, the idea of community production has really taken hold. And I think I may be able to convince some people of that, 
by bringing in something I on purpose did so far not bring in, and that is urban gardening. Urban gardening, I take some pride in that, obviously, is something that I think I was literally the first person in Detroit who planted gardens in the city of Detroit on Mack Avenue. And in the meantime, I think this has become common knowledge that urban gardening is all over the place. There are hardly any cities left in which people don't do it. And of course it is the obvious and easy, uh, the initial way of having community production. That is people from the community come together and they don't use fabricators or, or other sorts of machines all the time, they move in that direction and they certainly are learning. And in many, that's also part of your question or the answer to your question, that is, that in, at, at this point, literally no longer to be counted. I mean, the number of uh, villages and cities and countries in which people practice and learn and develop uh, what we call community production is is uh, is rampant at this point has become a galloping phenomenon, and so yes, I think I, I know we have our weaknesses and some things don't happen quite as quickly as we expect, but if you especially concentrate on on vegetables and gardening, but also on you know, the number of uh, places in which now people practice and learn and study how to use fabricators, how to put very thin layers of dust through a fabricator so that they get welded to each other and make three-dimensional objects. I mean, I am actually, people sometimes accuse me of, of having things that I should make more of a fuss about, and that I'm too modest. So I'll jump the other way right now and be anything but modest. I mean, the point is that the world over at this point, there are fabricators all over the place, literally. Whether you are in India or whether you're in Russia or whether you wherever, fabricators have become part of the scene. And quite frankly, if you look back at the book I wrote, at this point, quite a number of years ago, New Work, New Culture, I had a chapter on fabricators in that book, way ahead of anybody else. Yeah, so a lot of those elements, people can just Google right now themselves and get plenty of information on how to do urban, urban gardening or, or use fabricators and, uh, and can see you know, both the, the, the hype having to do with some of that, that, that I know that in past discussions with you, you've emphasized that, you know, Fabricators are not like the Star Trek, uh, uh, you know, f creators where it just you know can pump out any kind of food. Or there's certainly we're not we're not engaging in fantasy here. There's a lot of logistics involved. Some kinds of uh, tools are going to be uh, more easy to produce in that way than others. Um, we're not saying you can get entirely off the grid uh, quite yet, but uh, the, there's a lot of work being done already in the area that you're espousing, that this is, this is something that is not your invention. This is something that you are, you are uh, latching on trends that are already out in the culture. Um, and as far as the new work specific projects to bring these together, right? What's often miss, missed in uh, efforts that are just about urban gardening or just about fabricators is of course the, the idea of a social vision that will connect creating these things not just with, oh, it's really cool to do this particular thing or to reduce costs in this particular way, but with a wholesale attempt to revitalize culture and transform in the face of the new economy. Exactly. I mean, that is precisely the point. The, the contribution of new work is to take these pieces and like stones for a mosaic and make a pattern out of them, make a picture out of them, make a hole out of them, make a hole of both sides of what is now collapsing and of what is taking its place. And I would trumpet it from, from uh, the rooftops that that is more missing than anything else. 
I mean, if you talk in any country for any length of time, people say, I have no idea where it's going. I don't know what to do. We don't know where there's something added. So there's a general sense of complete disorientation. And we don't try to do everything, but we have worked towards what I just now summarized, namely a picture of what's dying and of what's coming, more than anybody else, I would say. Yeah, we, uh, I mean, it's, I would just sort of fight you a little on the idea that we are only doing what, is, what are trends. I, my picture is that we prophesied that before they were trends and they've become trends now. And now they are all over the place. And now, of course, what people always were skeptical about has in fact happened because lots of these things now have become real. All right. Well, what, what did you want? What else did you want to talk about in this? Or should we just wrap it up? If there is a little more time, uh, then I want to go on and say, yes, there is community production. Community production can only also take the form which that has in the case of the motorcycle, so that it's not just in one place, one, uh, one object, so to say, but it spreads and it becomes many things and it becomes a network and it becomes a network of many connected small factories that uh, sort of in a franchise fashion combine a great deal. And that's kind of quickly in parentheses. What is absolutely not in parentheses is what always has been a main part and maybe the main attraction part of new work. And that is that from the very beginning, we emphasized that work could become something entirely different from what work has been through the ages. You know, work started with the, the Old Testament and basically was conceived as a punishment for having committed the original sin. You have to work well, in the sweat of your brow, and it's penalty for what you did. And that lasted through the whole Middle Ages. Work was always thought of as a penalty, as a punishment, as something one had to suffer, as something one ached under, like it was a disease. And that actually, I think, it will maybe be our greatest single contribution to portray an infinitely more attractive, incomparably more telling and more, uh, more useful and charming way of thinking about work. That what we from the beginning said was the idea that people could discover what it was in the, in, the, in the domain of work, what was it that they really, really wanted to do, and the double really became a sort of proverbial expression. What is it that you really, really want to do? And that is not just something that turns you on for half an hour, but we developed this into a methodology. We developed that into things that are taught in workshops and seminars and in all manner of fashions. That is. We start from something that was original with us, uh, namely the idea of the poverty of desire, that most people don't understand their own desires very well. And uh, that was something on which we have turned, turned out to be very right. The people picked up on the, on the phrase, the poverty of desire, and came back and said, yes, that's, uh, yeah, we suffer from the poverty of desire. We don't know what we want. I don't don't know what I want, and I haven't figured out what I want. And that is the really sad and horrible part about my life, that I haven't figured it out, and I don't know how. I don't know how may be the most important part of this. That is, people have, don't know how to do this. So we have developed all kinds of methodologies, all kinds of different you know, ways of schooling people towards discovering step by step, and we do that very step by step, what it really is that they want and what it is that they desire. And that starts from the most elementary things, that is, we actually hold sessions where 
people how to appreciate different flavors of ice cream. Uh, and and, uh, and not very mundane and ordinary things like this, but with the idea that they learn, learn is what I say, they learn how to uh, find the taste, how to evaluate the test, how to discover what is the flavor they really want. And it starts from there, that is the beginning. But we go on from there to all kinds of physical exercises, to things that have to do with dance, to things that have to do with art, all of these being things that uh, sort of are like a training, like a school, uh, like something that moves very through a methodology, step by step, very like uh, a course of studies towards, and towards getting to the point where you have a much firmer, clear grasp on, in the area of work, that's the important point. What is it in the area of work that I really, not just sort of vaguely find some kind of fun in, but, and now comes what is an absolutely crucial word for a new work. That is, our aim from the beginning was to help people to develop their work as a calling, to make work something that they experience as a calling, as a calling in the way uh, Gandhi experienced his work as a calling, to experience uh, work in the same way in which King experienced his work as a calling, a calling which obviously has a religious flavor, which is way beyond just uh, enjoying something that will bring me in some modicum of success, but instead of that, something that with the utmost seriousness from the depth of my soul, I can say, yes, this is work that I want, and this is work that I really and seriously want to do. And we have, uh, I'm now close to a conclusion, we have developed this into uh, three categories or three words or three predicates. Well, one of these is that work that is a calling is work that gives people strength. And we mean that very literally, that work can be exhausting, work can be debilitating, but work can give strength to people, make them more robust, make them more alive, make them more strong. And from the very beginning, I would say that has been one of the main attractions of new work. The idea that work can be something wholly different from what work has been in the past. Not a drudgery, not something you suffer, not something you have to put up with, not something that you would experience as a mild disease that you hope will be over as soon as you can be. But on the contrary, work becomes the most desirable thing we have in our lives. That nothing is as wonderful as work that we really love to do. Nothing strengthens us as much as having a calling and pursuing that calling. And the three words are, for one thing, strength, that a calling gives one strength, but a, a calling can also give one uh, meaning. And let me split that up and say, a calling has it in it that uh, you can do something that has a significance to it, and for many people a very specific and important significance, namely they find out that there is work that makes for them the transition from being half dead to being alive, or being uh, a full living. The difference between a human being that doesn't really live and a human being that actually does live. That is something that new work prides itself on making possible for people to help them step by step, and it takes a long time, but step by step up a ladder, up a steep pathway, up an Eiffel Tower towards 
something that is not a, a, a mild disease, but something that they experience as a as something that comes from deep inside of them and that they want to do with all their heart. And that uh, adds to one more thing. I mean, it is the third word, so to say, and these blend into each other to some extent, that we, we uh, complain a great deal in the literature of our time and in our daily lives and in schools and in children and in whatnot about the fact that things are pretty meaningless and pretty dreary. And that is the difference between new work and old work. That new work makes it possible for people to live a life that is a fully lived life. And it is at work as a calling leads people to a point where they do feel that now, now that they have discovered a calling, they are really alive. And that ultimately is the highest point. That no, uh, you don't have to put up with a whole life that actually is just sort of a coasting along, a putting up with it, a, a bearing it. But on the contrary, it is possible with the, the, so to say, with everything that has new work been working on to live a life that is fully and really lived.